Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Are you getting out of here on time? I looked up to see my boss Barry Masters looking into my office. He wore the same cheesy grin he always wore on the nights that he would be coming to my house for dinner. He enjoyed rubbing it in that he was going to screw my wife. I guess I should start at the beginning. My name is Bill Jack Swinsky, pronounced Jack Swinsky. Most people know me as Billy Jack or just Jacko. I am a 35-year-old account executive for a small-time piss and advertising agency in Houston, Texas. Now being an account executive in one of the large New York or Los Angeles agencies would mean a lot of power and responsibility, not to mention money and respect. At BM and Sons it just means that I handle everything while Barry sits on his fat bum and reads those horrid bodice ripper novels. As if it isn't bad enough that he reads these books meant for lonely and bored housewives, he has to please himself after he reads the love scenes. So here's this douchebag sticking his head in my office asking if I am getting out of here on time, when he knows damn good and well that I will be, since he hired Amy, and in turn with an awesome set of jugs, and a bum to match. Leaving the office on time has been no problem at all. But since tonight is the night, I told him I had a few things to finish up and that I would be out in half an hour. Fine, I'll go eat at the Royal Fork, but I expect you and Lynn to be ready when I get there. And Jacko, I do mean ready. Ready meant Lynn was to be naked and I was to be wearing my chastity device. I know most males wouldn't consider me to be a real man, but I do what I have to do to survive. I met my wife Lynn 10 years ago at a Christmas party given by a local bank. They were Barry's largest client and their dedication to us is what mainly kept the agency afloat. Since I was the one who mainly handled their account I was invited to the party as well. Lynn was a teller in their drive-up only branch. I spent the evening making small talk with some of the personnel that I knew from my dealings with them. I was talking to the manager of the loan department about a planned golf outing they had planned for shortly after Christmas. It seemed that his usual partner was going through a rough divorce and had in fact been assaulted with his own clubs. Since Barry closed our office from Christmas Eve until New Year's Day, I agreed to play. As I was talking golf with the group who were attending the golf outing, I began to notice a few women were gravitating towards our little gathering. We were discussing our handicaps when a well-developed blonde spoke up. Hey Bob, why haven't any of the tellers been asked to this outing? She was wearing the proverbial little black dress. Her bosom was truly testing the limits of its bodice and my eyes were locked on like a hawk on a field mouse. I almost didn't realize she was talking directly to me when she asked, So what's your handicap? Now I am no neurosurgeon. Nor am I any kind of expert on the functions of the human brain. So I cannot explain why the only word to fly out of my mouth in response to her golf question was great jugs. Guffaws of laughter came from everywhere. I could feel my face turning red. That's funny, said someone. Damn, why can't I come up with original answers like that? Asked someone else. The girl in the black cocktail dress and, screw me, Pumps gave a chuckle and then said, Well, I guess you will be in the traps all day. Luckily, I had the presence of mind to play it off as a joke. I seriously doubt I'll spend all day in the traps. Not many scratch golfers do. Wow. Are you considered a scratch? Asked Bob. No, but it sounded good. This brought another round of laughter. I didn't bother telling them that I had been close to going to Q school before I got hired by Barry. The conversation turned back to golf and I felt relieved that I hadn't made a complete burn out of myself. Barry might not have liked it much if I had. Soon the group went separate directions and I found myself back at the bar. Care to buy me a drink? I turned to find myself looking into the ice blue eyes of the little black dress owner. No, but I will buy their owner one as an apology for my Freudian slip. She laughed, and we talked the rest of the night away. When the party was over, she kissed me good night and headed for her car. I'll see you at the golf course, sir. Just wait until you see what I wear. I swallowed hard as I imagined her in some tight shorts or a mini skirt bending over to pick her ball out of the cup. I thought to myself as I waved goodbye. I figured that Barry and his wife Joan were off screwing whomever. The only reason they ever went to these things was to find new sex buddies. I wondered if they ever screwed each other, and I had my doubts that Barry was truly the father of all of his sons that no one has ever met. During the first month that I worked for Barry, Joan propositioned me four different times. In the end my morals and the fear that Barry would fire me won out, and I never took Joan up on her offers. 
Truth be known, I was probably also saved from a few social diseases. Wednesday morning, I went to the golf club and found the group from the bank. The day was damp and chilly, so I felt sure that everyone would be in long pants rather than shorts. Having been born and raised in Wyoming, I wore shorts 90% of the year. Unless I was at work, of course. Half of the people from the party didn't show up. They were trying to figure out how to divide up 13 people when I walked up. Billy, damn glad you came, Bob said as he greeted me. We thought we would have five or six foursomes, but as you can see, we are well short of that number. Do you mind playing in a twosome? I told him that I didn't mind playing in a twosome. I was profoundly disappointed that Lynn wasn't among the attendees. I was told that I would be in a twosome with Jerry Montez, a commercial loan officer, but when a member of the first foursome wasn't there at their scheduled tea time, Bob asked Jerry to go join them. My new partner still wasn't there as the second group was about to take the tea box. Just as Bob was trying to figure out what to do, he exclaimed, Okay, here's your partner, Billy. Try to stay out of the traps. As the group began laughing, I turned to see my partner approaching. Sorry, got hung up trying to buy teas. I turned and found myself face to face with Lynn. She was wearing a purple fleece pullover and heavy knit yoga pants. While the pullover hid any hint of cleavage, the pants definitely displayed her curves. Where is everyone? She asked. First group is probably on the green by now, said Bob. Do you mind playing in a twosome with Billy here? She gave me a wink. Not as long as he brought his money. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. We bet on everything. Usually during a foursome we bet drinks, or stunts, or whatever anyone is willing to bet. High stroke counts cost a person drinks at the turn, explained Bob. I hope you brought enough money, Billy, she said. I didn't say anything. Bob was laughing as he teed up on the white box. He hit what looked like a respectable drive, and then the foursome was on their way down the fairway. Lynn and I made our way onto the tea box. Ladies first, I said as she bent over to place her tea. I was admiring the shape of bum as she bent over to make her set up. Stop staring at my bum pervert. Damn, did she have eyes in the crack of her bum? I wasn't even looking your way. I was watching your colleague hacking away in the rough over there. She stood up and looked down the fairway, where a guy was swinging wildly in the long grass about a hundred yards away. Oh, she said. I didn't mean that you're a perv, by the way. I just figured that you were. Yeah, you figured I was staring at your delectable bum, I know. She gasped. Oh, so you were. I'm going to have to keep an eye on you, Buster. Just so fair's fair. I get to stare at you while you tee up. I said okay. I think you can go ahead and drive now. They are on the green. She swung and drove the ball about 170 yards and turned to me with a smirk. Top that Mr. Nice Dugs. I stepped up to the black tee box and set my ball in tee. And if I top that, what do I get? I asked. If you outdrive me from there, I'll play the back nine in my tight white shorts and tank top, she said wiggling her bum. I had never driven with a boner so I didn't know how it would affect my swing. I gulped audibly and addressed my ball. Then she started cheating. While I was aligning myself, she was making comments about my bum. Then she said she'd make me play the back nine in my underwear. Fortunately, I was able to tune her out and hit a 280-yard drive that bent around the dogleg and came up 50 yards shy of the green. I turned and said, I know your bum will look fantastic in them shorts. All she could say was, shit. Needless to say, I enjoyed watching her play golf in her tight white shorts and tank top. I also ended up not paying for our first three dates. Three months later, we were an exclusive couple. I found out early on that she thought that Barry was a jerk-off. We were finishing dinner when she asked if there were any women in my office. Thinking that she was worried that I had a wandering eye, I told her that the only woman was Jane, a 65-year-old grandmother who basically answered phones and made coffee. I bet the creep ogles her chest anyway, Lynn said and chuckled. I laughed when a mental image of Barry checking out Jane's rack hit my head. I pictured her slapping him with the big purse she carried with her everywhere. I Lynn's parents at Thanksgiving. They flew in from San Diego and spent the week with her. I met them Thanksgiving morning and we all had the dinner that she and her mother had prepared. After dinner I offered to bring her a slice of pie. I instead returned from the kitchen with a ring on a pie plate and I proposed to her. George Carlin once mused that people don't seem to get laid much at Thanksgiving. He definitely wasn't there that Thanksgiving. Once Lynn's parents had returned to their hotel, 
she proceeded to screw my brains out. We were married on a boat in Galveston that following May. My parents bought me a house in an upscale section of Pasadena as a pre-wedding gift. That way if you end up in divorce court, you still have a roof, sonny boy, were my dad's words of wisdom as he handed me the keys. I told them that divorce wasn't in my future, but thanked them for the forethought. Lynn and I moved in after our honeymoon and settled into our life. During our first four years of marriage, I could never complain about our sex life. Other aspects of our life, however, left a lot to be desired. When Lynn and I got together, she was barely making ends meet. I assumed that was because she didn't make a lot as a bank teller. As they say, when you assume, you make out of you and me. I allowed Lynn to handle our finances for the first six months of our marriage. I figured that since she worked in a bank, she'd be good with money. I was wrong. It took me a year and a half to get us back to even afterwards. I was constantly paying the shut-off notices rather than the utility bills. We had several long discussions and quite a few arguments. I even spent several nights on the couch. Eventually our raises and my fiscal head got us a tidy savings built up, but it didn't last. Within two years we were back to struggling. Her paycheck covered most of her credit card bills. My salary went to pay everything else. Barry wasn't paying me near enough, so I was getting ready to start spreading my resume around in hopes of a better paycheck, but I knew most reputable agencies won't count small-time experience. The week it all turned to shit started out just like any other week. After paying the bills, I had managed to buy food for the week and fill our gas tanks. I had even managed to tuck away a few bucks in case it was needed. Work was fairly normal Monday morning until Barry called Walt into his office. I couldn't tell what was being said, but I could hear Walt's voice gaining in intensity. In minutes, they were screaming at each other. The only thing I definitely heard was Walter telling Barry that Marion and Joan were both worthless 304s and that he hoped that Barry's tool would rot off. I had no clue who Marion was, but Barry seemed to take his wife being called a 304 in stride, probably because it was true. As Walt stormed out of Barry's office, he made a beeline for my desk. As soon as he started approaching me, Barry was telling Jane to call the police. Walt got to my desk and said, You better watch your back, Jacko. I was about to ask Walt what the hell I had done to him when Barry screamed at him to leave, or he would press charges. Walt looked at him and yelled, Screw you, you dickless son of a witch, as he headed out the door. You better watch your back, Jacko. For the rest of the day, Walt's words would play through my mind. So much to the point that I was dwelling on them, and almost got killed by a fast-moving truck as I got off of the beltway onto the feeder. I am grateful that his brakes worked better than my brain, or I'd have been a statistic. When I got home, the first thing that struck me was that Lynn was already home. Usually she worked until 7. I walked into the house to find her lounging on a new white couch. That couch had not been in my living room that morning when I had left for work. Neither had the matching love seat and easy chairs. Hey baby, she said. You like? I called off work today and went shopping at that new furniture store over in the Galleria. I fell in love with this set and bought them on the spot. Are you mad, honey? Were they free? She scoffed. As if. I got a good deal though for opening a new account with the store. I got us good payments. All I could do was smile. I knew that if I opened my mouth a torrent of vulgarity would flow and we'd have a war all night. Instead I smiled and went into the den to figure out just how bad she just made things. After I'd figured it all out I knew there was no way I could take a pay cut to move to a new job. I hated the idea that I was going to have to slave for screwing Barry. The only upside was the fact that after Lynn bought something like this I got some kitty. After dinner we were sitting on her expensive purchase watching TV when I started making my moves. I started sucking her earlobes and trying to work a hand under her skirt when she stopped me dead in my tracks. A uh, lover boy. We aren't doing anything on this couch, but if you take me to bed you can take me back there. She must have been a mind reader. I was pretty much worn out when I made it to work the next morning. My head was still stuck on the side of my lin flat on her stomach with a pillow. I had pounded her into a sweaty ball of whimpering jelly before I was done. I was sure that she'd call off of work or call in late. She usually did after an all-night sex fest like that. I was tired but a few cups of coffee had me running full steam when Barry got to work that day. He gave me a funny glance as he went to his office. I never paid much attention to Barry, so the look didn't mean anything to me. 
Ten minutes later, a most striking young lady walked into the office. Jane greeted her. Can I help you, ma'am? Yes. I'm Amy Stewart and I have a nine o'clock with a Mr. Barry Masters. Jane picked up the phone and spoke. Then she hung up and said, You may go on in Miss Stewart, as she pointed to Barry's office. I called Lynn later on. She was at home as I figured she'd be. You didn't go to work, baby? I asked her. I was mildly annoyed but also a bit proud. I called in and said I'd be late, she replied. Someone wore me out last night. Is that someone ready to wear me out again tonight? You know he is baby, I said. After a few minutes we hung up. I was setting an ad up when Barry came out with the young lady in tow. Amy, this is Jacko. We call him Jacko because his name is too damn hard to pronounce. Jacko, this is Amy. She's taking Walt's place and will be following you around for the next few days. With that he turned and made his way back into his office. Bill Jack Swinsky, but please feel free to call me Jacko. Amy Stewart, she said as she offered me her hand. I had the insane urge to kiss it like in the movies. Can I call you Bill? I told her she could indeed call me Bill, and we set about the tasks of the day. I showed her the ropes and tried damn hard not to stare at her. Her scent was intoxicating. Of course I wasn't too surprised that Barry had to keep coming out and sticking his nose in. I had at first worried that Barry might have hired Amy because she was a knockout. She soon proved to quite a smart woman who knew her way around the ad game. I was curious why she'd be in a podunk shithole agency like Barry's when she could have easily been a star on Madison Avenue. I went home that night and screwed Lynn again. We didn't pull the all-nighter like the previous night, but we finished just as sweaty. I was pretty clear-headed when I went to work the next morning. Shortly before noon Barry called me into his office. I could tell he was irate but I hadn't a clue why. You screwed up Jacko. I screwed up? What? How? He pulled an ad for a car lot I had worked on and showed me. They were going to hold a drawing for $500. I remembered the ad well. When he showed me the ad it said the drawing was for $5,000. Alan, who owned the lot was livid and was threatening to pull his account. I got him calmed down and we are printing a revised ad as we speak. I ought to fire you on the spot Jacko but I have a better idea. I want to meet you at your house tonight for dinner. I like fish by the way. I want to discuss this with you and Lynn before I decide what to do about you. I'll be there at 6 o'clock. I had no idea why the a-hole wanted to involve my wife but I knew she hated him and would most likely do whatever she could to spite him. I didn't give it much more thought as the day went by. What does that a-hole want me to do? Asked Lynn when I told her all about my foul up and Barry's idea. Dirty old prick probably just wants to stare at your jugs for a while tonight. Or wants us to join them for a swapping party. I'll cut your tool off before I ever let you screw Joan Masters, buddy boy. And I am sure that if I ever saw Barry Masters naked I'd want to gouge my eyes out with a rusty spoon, she said as she shuddered. I shuddered. I'd cut my own tool off before I'd screw her. Dinner was good. I was a little pissed off that Barry kept eyeballing my wife. I noticed that she kept moving in ways to avoid giving him a decent look at her body. She'd even wore a long-sleeved turtleneck sweater despite the late spring heat. Once dinner was over Barry said, Okay, we've had a great dinner, he looked at Lynn. Very good dinner, my dear. She blushed slightly and thanked him. He cracked his knuckles and said, I don't know if you know this or not, Lynn, but your husband nearly cost me a huge account today. I had to stifle a laugh. Lynn and I often talked about how Barry believed himself to be the king of Madison Avenue when he ran such a penny ante little agency. I see no reason to punish him if it was saved. Because, my dear, he needs to learn not to be distracted by the new young lady in the office and concentrate on his job. Lynn threw me a look as I scowled at Barry's words. He knew I had never been anything less than professional. I had told Lynn all about Amy as well. I might have downplayed her attractiveness, but Lynn knew I wasn't interested. What do you propose we do to teach him, Barry? I propose we screw right in front of him. I was stunned. My mind was screaming that I should get up and beat the living dog's head out of Barry whether I needed a job or not. Lynn looked as if he had just asked her to eat a bucket of pig shit. I almost laughed at her look of revulsion. Barry, however, seemed to not notice. That's a lovely offer, Barry, she said in a placating voice. I was instantly reminded how silly the thought of her ever giving in to him was. I knew she'd shoot him down in flames. There are two problems with your offer, though, she continued. First, 
I am sure my husband would divorce me in a heartbeat for even considering it. Second, I only have eyes for him. I say we forgive and forget and move along with our lives. He wouldn't divorce you, Lynn. Most men fantasize about seeing their wife screw another man. I don't, I chimed in, but Barry carried on with aplomb, as if I hadn't even been in the room. If he divorces you, my dear, he ends up paying for you to live in this house until you decide to marry someone else, and then you get half of its value from him. If he divorces you, I'll fire him, and then he'll be hard-pressed to meet the large alimony payments you would be due to receive. You have him over a barrel, my lady. Look, Barry, she said. I love him, and I know he loves me. Why would I want to hurt him? You wouldn't hurt him. You'd only be taking control. She looked unsure, so he continued. Do you mean to tell me, Lynn, that you like having to have his approval to go out with your friends? You have to justify buying something pretty for yourself? Do you mean to tell me that you aren't even the slightest bit ready to make him crawl for you? Lynn, what I am proposing will give you absolute control over him. All you have to do is tell me that he isn't towing the line, and I'll ruin him. I can make sure he never works in advertising again, and he'll have to work several jobs to stay out of prison. Not to mention the fact that it will improve your sex life by leaps and bounds. Think, Lynn. Not only could you have sex anytime you want, but you could have sex with any guy you want. Jacko there will eventually realize his love for you goes deeper than mere sex. He'll be happy to see you fulfill all of your fantasies. And, when you do allow him the enjoyment of your body, he'll appreciate it so much that he'll bend over backwards to please you. You can't lose Lynn. He's nuts. I thought, or stupid. I was wondering what exact words my wife would use to shoot him down. I was sure he'd fire me after she lit into him, but it would be worth it. I would also track him down some night, ring his doorbell, and kick the shit out of him. Needless to say, I got the shock of my life when she asked, what are we waiting for? I just sat there in shock. I kept expecting her to start laughing and tell him he had been sucked in. Usually when she did that to me, she'd go for an old term and say, psyche. Even as they were stripping each other, I expected her to call the joke off. Finally, I got pissed and grabbed Barry by the scruff of the neck and began frog marching him out of my house. He was chattering on about firing me and suing me for assault when Lynn hollered from behind, Damn it, Bill, you stop right there. What? You can't be serious, Lynn. I know you can't stand this scumsucker. I am serious, Bill. You almost screwed his business up and he isn't going to fire you. So this is the least I can do. You best stop this foolish bullshit right now or I will. You'll what? Divorce me? Fine, we'll get a divorce, and then you can work your bum off in menial jobs trying to keep my standard of living high enough to keep me from having you thrown in jail. And I'll have you locked up for laying your hands on me, chimed in Barry. I was going to make this easy for you, but now you have to get in here and watch. I'll key. You'll do nothing. You'll sit back and take it. You have no other choice. Cuck or prison. Come on, Lynn. Let me show you how a real man treats a woman. I'd like to say that Lynn came to her senses and tossed Barry out on his bum. I'd like to tell you that she laughed when she saw his pathetic tool. When all was said and done, Barry left, admonishing me to be on time for work in the morning. If I hadn't been broke, I would have bought a pistol that night and sent two certain people to meet Jesus. Lynn came out of the bedroom a little while after Barry left. I was sitting on the new expensive couch. You can stop sulking, Bill. It's over for tonight. Come to bed. Screw you. I'm not sleeping in that bed ever again. I'll sleep on the couch. I'm sure Gladberry doesn't turn you on. If he had, you'd have screwed him on the table, and then I'd never be able to eat. Look, I'm sorry, Bill, but I... I don't know. He was talking about all of the power I'd have, and it turned me on immensely. I think he's a disgusting pig, but he had me so hot that I was ready to explode. Yeah. The way you were urging him on and telling him how great he was sure made you sound disgusted. And telling him he was better than me? That was so out of line. Unless you have been lying to me about how good I am. And there was no way he's bigger. Come on, Bill. He wasn't that small. Of course, the way you were carrying on. I would have thought you were screwing Long Tool McGee. Yes, I enjoyed it. Having power and humiliating you was a huge turn on for me. Seeing you humble and powerless got me going. Even talking about it makes me horny. Come screw me, baby. I need it. I won't tell Barry. Get bent 304. I can't even look at you without feeling cheated, anger, and revulsion. No thank you. 
Come on, Bill. I'm sure Barry won't keep this up for too long. Once was too long. I'm here still only because I am between a rock and a hard place. I'm still here because I have no options, I said trying hard to keep from crying in front of her. You humiliated me. I have to look at that a whole every day, now knowing he thinks he's a better lover than I am. I have to deal with knowing that he took the one thing in this world that I held truly precious. I lay on the couch and crossed my arm over my eyes. I heard her shuffle off to the bedroom. I couldn't even think straight. I knew there had to be a way out of my predicament, but I couldn't see it. I went in early to work and tried to get to my tasks. I was doing well until Barry came in and shot me a smirky grin. It took everything I had not to walk over and smash his smug face. I didn't know exactly how I was going to deal with the whole situation, but snippets of a plan were coming to me. After doing a little research on the internet, I knew what steps I had to take first. I needed to leave work early. That would be no problem. I also needed Lynn to be at work. She probably was, because Barry surely didn't wear her out. I spent most of my morning on the internet locating the things I needed to turn the tables on my wife. I would lose my job, but I wouldn't lose my home. I located several places in Houston where I could get what I sought. Around noon I went to Barry's office and told him I was leaving. I never said you could leave early, he said. Yeah, you did. I made this appointment three weeks ago and told you about it then. I cleared this with you long before I made the appointment. I was lying through my teeth, but Barry never remembered things. Jane usually conned him out of three weeks vacation every year. He stared at the wall stupidly for a minute and then said, Okay. Yeah, I remember. Go ahead, but you better be at home when I get there this evening. What? No one ever said. Jacko, this was set up last night. Maybe if you hadn't been sulking you would have known. I'm also going to have a surprise for you. I know you hate me, but that just makes it sweeter. I don't hate you, Barry. But I can't say I'd piss on you if you were on fire. Six o'clock, Jacko. Don't be late. Screw you, I said under my breath as I closed the office door. My first stop was an electronics store across town. I bought several mini cameras and microphones. The guy at the store told me how to set it all up. He said they were motion activated, and they sent the video to a secure website so that even if someone compromised my computer the videos would be safe. My next stop was an attorney's office. Paris Hyde was the least likely name I had ever heard for an attorney, but her reputation for helping men with marital problems was legendary. I told her the complete story and what I was doing to gather evidence. She confirmed that I didn't need to disclose my espionage because I was sole owner of my property. She advised me not to drop my bombs until she had everything ready to file. She also said I had to sit through at least one more session to get evidence to support my claims. Under Texas law, I could divorce her for cruelty or adultery, and in some cases both could be listed as cause. She also gave me other avenues to pursue. I couldn't wait to laugh in Barry's face. I went home and set the cameras up. I put three in the bedroom and two in the dining room. The other two I put in the living room. By time I was done, I had time to move my clothes into my office. I also retrieved a pillow and a blanket from the hallway closet. Lynn had bought them only because they were on sale. That closet was full of crap she bought on impulse. After I placed them in the office, I went out to a bar. I got home around 9 to find Lynn was sitting at the table drinking a glass of wine. I didn't say a word to her as I went in to take a shower. For the first time since I had moved out of my parents' house, I locked the bathroom door. I thought I heard the door rattle, but I was unsure. I smiled to think that I could indeed keep control of my life, and that soon she'd know how little control she really had. I took my time getting dressed and went straight to my office. A few minutes later the door opened and Lynn walked in. I mentally added, by a lock set for the office door, to my to-do list. I had just logged onto my computer to see how much evidence my cameras had gotten during my absence. I quickly shrank the window as she sat on the edge of my desk. My heart ached because she had done that so many times. She'd sat on the corner of my desk many times to let me know she was horny. Horny was the last feeling in my body. All I saw was a traitorous 304 on my desk. She didn't say anything. She just sat there staring at a spot on the wall. I looked up at her and asked, What? You've never locked me out of your shower before, she said with a sniffle. You've never completely disgusted me before. Were you coming in to tell me about the great sex with Barry? It wasn't great, she said. It was terrible. 
I realized what a pig he is and realized I was doing you wrong. Got you, I thought. I now had proof of adultery for my lawyer to use. He was mad that you weren't here, she continued. I told him that you'd been called away for an emergency. I let him have me thinking it would be as great as last night was, but it was horrid. So basically you both got off on humiliating me, I stated flatly. Without good old Bill to kick around the thrill was gone. Well boo. I thought you loved me, she whined. I did until you let Barry Masters between your legs. Last night was incredible, she said. All I want is to experience that again, and you are being a selfish brat and want to deny me. You're supposed to love me enough to help me achieve sexual bliss. It doesn't hurt you. Well, maybe your ego, but it is such a turn on for me. At that point, I realized that she was buying Barry's shit hook, line, and sinker. I told her one last time to get the hell out of my office, and then I left the house. I drove around aimlessly for a while and ended up in Galveston. Being Friday night, I had my pick of any number of bars. I opted for one that I had never been to before. Lynn and I used to go down to Galveston a lot. We'd spend the day on the beach and then close down a bar. As I was drinking, I saw Hank Shaw walk in. Hank was working for Barry when I started. He left to work for a local radio station five years ago. He saw me and came over to where I was sitting. Bill. Long time no see. Hey Hank. How's the radio life treating you? I can't witch. Are you still with that jerk, Barry? Unfortunately. Did you hear that Walt left? No. I haven't seen Walt in a couple of years, actually. He came to the station and hit me up for a job. Told me Barry was making his life hell, and he had to get out of there. Yeah, I hear that. I know I am tired of his third-rate bum. You know, just between you and me, I know Barry has run a lot of good people off. Hell, when I worked for him he screwed two different guys' wives. Can you believe that shit? What always got to me was neither one beat his bum for it. At that point his party arrived, and he bade me farewell, and went to sit with his friends. Two guys' wives. I decided I had to talk to Walt. Maybe he hadn't threatened me that day but warned me. Before I left the bar I asked Hank if he knew how to get a hold of Walt. He said he didn't so I left. I got home and crashed out on the couch. I didn't see or hear Lynn and I was just fine with that. I was dying to talk to Walt, but in a city the size of Houston, you just can't go door to door until the right guy answers. Just as I fell asleep the answer hit me. Lynn was gone when I got up Saturday morning. I went to Lowe's and bought a lock set for my office and installed it. I opened up the cameras on my computer and checked to see what they had recorded. I saw Lynn and Barry screw for about five minutes. I heard Barry apologizing over and over for not making her please. She assured him she was fine and said it would be better when I was back. Speaking of Jacko, she told him, I wanted to witch slap her for calling me that. I tolerated it at work because I got paid to be there. I would not tolerate her calling me that. Speaking of Jacko, we might want to go easier on him. Let's keep our activities to Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's fine, said Barry. I have things on most nights anyway. I just wanted to make Jacko sweat. We'll make him wear the surprise next time. Surprise? I opened all of the video files and watched Barry enter the house carrying something in a bag. He told her how much he'd like to pound her on the couch and she chastised him and said nobody would ever screw on her couch. He told her he'd brought my surprise, but since he and Lynn were in such a hurry to have sex, he showed her what was in the bag as they rushed down the hallway. I had no camera in the hall, so the surprise would remain just that. A surprise. Horny, I said dismayed that I didn't know what the surprise was. I spent the rest of the weekend avoiding Lynn. If she was home, I tried my damnedest to be out and about. I spent Sunday evening in my office. She had tried to tell me that Barry had been by on Saturday evening but the video revealed the truth. She had sat around drinking wine and pleasing herself. The nice thing about Barry is the fact that he's completely predictable. He leaves the office at 5 o'clock every day without fail. He expects the rest of us to stay until 5.30. Jane leaves at 10 after, and then everyone else drifts out leaving an empty office by 5.20. On Monday I found myself alone in the office at 5.30. I went into Barry's office and opened his computer. I knew his passwords because the guy actually had Jane write them down in case he forgot them. I opened the top drawer on her desk and was rewarded with not only his passwords, but also sticky notes to write them on. In short manner, I was in Barry's computer and rifling through the personnel records. 
I got Walt's address and logged out. I also wrote on Barry's calendar an approval for a vacation day for Wednesday. I also noticed that Jane had pinned herself in for vacation the following week. As I was leaving I thought I heard someone in the office, but I didn't see anyone. I took a quick look around and left. I stopped at What a Burger on the way home. Lynn never liked me eating fast food so it would piss her off, and I could eat in my office and not be around her. Tuesday passed by rather quickly. Barry came over that night and I found out what my surprise was. It was a metal cage designed to cause me pain if my tool got hard. It was also designed to prevent me from fapping. Needless to say, if they expected me to be tortured by it, they were sorely disappointed. I hadn't sported wood since the whole Barry debacle began. Barry did mention bringing Amy in for a threesome. I wondered how he'd get her into this mess. I did get quite a kick out of hearing Lynn going to town with her pleasing toy mere minutes after telling Barry what a stud he was. On Wednesday, I went to see Walt. I arrived at the address I got from Barry's computer and rang the doorbell. I could tell that the woman who answered the door had once been a damn attractive woman. She still would be, but she looked haunted. I could tell that stress was eating her alive. I felt bad when I asked for Walt. The look of guilt on her face when she told me where I could find him was heart-wrenching. By the time I thanked her for her help and she closed the door there were tears rolling down her face. I almost tried to say something comforting but decided I didn't know the situation, so I just moved on with my quest. I found Walt right where she said I would. He was in a room at a real shithole motel, just off the freeway. Not even the hookers brought Johns to the dump, but I suppose it was cheap shelter. I knocked on the door. I was shocked when a disheveled version of Walt opened the door. He was wearing a dirty wife beater and a pair of cargo shorts that appeared to be five sizes too large. He stepped back from the door as if he was a vampire and the daylight would kill him. Jacko, what the hell are you doing here? Well, I tried to talk to you at your house, but I was redirected here. His face sunk when he looked at me. Barry got to you, didn't he? Damn it, I should have warned you before. Come in, man. Hell, I should have risked jail to fully warn you in front of Barry. I walked into the room that served as Walt's domicile. There was a saga single bed in the middle of the room flanked by a threadbare couch on one side and a small table and two rickety chairs on the other. Jacko, part of what is happening to you is my fault. How the hell can it be your fault, Walt? You left before Barry started his shit with me. Well, let me tell you a story, Jacko. I knew from the first time that Barry met my Mary and he wanted to screw her. It's just something about the guy. He has to do shit like that. The woman doesn't even have to be hot. I worked for Barry for 12 years. When I first got there a guy named Jarvis was in your position. Jarvis and I were pretty much the team along with Jane. Jarvis got married to a gal from Humble. She wasn't all that much to look at, but Jarvis loved her. One year at the bank Christmas party Barry tried to make the moves on Jarvis' wife. I left before the whole thing started, but I heard all about it. Jarvis nearly hospitalized Barry. When we got back to work that following Monday, Jarvis was gone and Barry was still wearing bruises. Barry brought Hank Shaw in, and then he replaced Jarvis with some college kid. I can't remember the name of the guy who replaced Jarvis, but I know Barry got to his wife and the guy quit. He was replaced a guy named Steve Harkin. A year later Steve left, and you replaced Steve. I had heard that Barry had gotten to Steve's wife. Barry had somehow figured out a way to get guys, wives to screw him without them beating his arse like Jarvis did. Unfortunately I soon found out how he was doing it. Just after Hank quit, Barry called me into his office and told me I had screwed up on an ad. He'd spent all morning long talking our client into not firing us and making it right with them. He told me he'd discuss my future later over dinner. I was to bring my wife and meet him at a local hotel. Scumsucker invited himself to my house for dinner. What did you screw up by the way? A. M. Motors. I accidentally put the wrong price on a car in the ad. Funny thing is, I don't even remember modifying the ad. Again the alarm bells were going off in my head. Anyway, Barry told Marion he wouldn't fire me if she'd consent to cucking me. He told her that there was no way we'd survive without my working for him. For three goddamned years he screwed her three times a week. One night I happened to run into Joan. I told her that Barry was screwing my wife. I didn't know they were swingers. Barry came over the following evening and informed me that his wife had told him about our meeting. He then told Marion to stop taking her birth control. He said my punishment for trying to break his marriage up 
was going to be me raising his scumsucker child. That morning in his office, I told him his bullshit had gone on long enough. He told me he'd decide when it was over. He told me that once he knocked Marion up he'd go after your wife. You know the rest. I'm living in this shithole while I divorce my wife. I don't know where I go from here though. Did you divorce Marion? I asked. Not yet. I think I can hurt her more by not divorcing her and never paying her a dime in alimony. I wish I had evidence to support an adultery claim. When I left Walt ten minutes later, he was a happier man. I told him I'd be in touch. I had told him enough of my plan to cheer him up, but not enough to derail it should Barry get wind of it. I felt pretty good as I drove a random pattern toward my home. It was early afternoon, and I had no desire to be home when Lynn got there. As I turned onto a main thoroughfare, I saw a familiar sight. I say familiar, even though I had never been there before in my life. I had, however, seen the picture of the place for as long as I had worked for Barry. A big cartoonish sign that read, AM Motors beckoned to me. I pulled onto the lot and was instantly set on by four eager salesmen. A tall guy with a handlebar mustache and a ridiculous 10-gallon hat had the lead and easily outpaced the other flopping ties. What can I do you for? He asked with an accent so thick it had to be fake. Name Sam Colt. Which of these beauties can I put you in today? Sam Colt, are you kidding me? No wonder people think Texans are idiots. I thought as he shook my hand. Well, Sam, I wanted to know what I had to do to get my name in the drawing for the 500 bucks. Oh, okay. We don't give away 500. We never draw for less than $5,000. You can enter for free just by agreeing to listen to a phone pitch, receive emailings, and to be on our mailing list. Or you can buy a car and get one entry for every thousand you spend. At 5.30 I found myself walking into my office. I now knew I had been railroaded. I was pissed off and I was looking for evidence to bury Barry. I wanted to contact the previous two guys that Barry had done this to. I went through all of the personnel files and found the two I was looking for. Steve Embry and Kenny Lawrence were easily located by accessing their college's alumni data groups. I didn't care if I was leaving an electronic trail, because I was using Barry's computer. I glanced at my watch and saw that it was just after 6. I knew the cleaning people came in at 9 so I had time. I opened some financial files and got into Barry's bookkeeping. I began looking for receipts from AM Motors. I found entries where every other client had paid us, but no AM Motors. I was intently looking through Barry's computer for information when I heard someone ask, Find anything good? I spun around and found myself looking into the ice blue eyes of Amy Stewart. I had been busted red handed. I was in the office after business hours, I was in the boss computer, and I had confidential files lying around. I was completely lost for words. The look on Amy's face was inscrutable. I had no clue if she was going to rat me out or screw me right there on Barry's desk. Then without realizing I was doing it I opened up and spilled my guts to her. I told her all about Barry cucking me and how he'd ruined a few other marriages. As I struggled to calm down, she rephrased her question. Did you find anything to bury this scumsucker? Amy and I left the office before the cleaning crew got there and went to have dinner at a small place near her place. We compared notes and she told me her life story. By the time she was done I knew things that changed the scope of what I was planning. I also now had a partner in crime. BM and Sons didn't mean what I thought it meant. It meant Burkhart, Markowitz and Sons. Jefferson Burkhart and Jacob Markowitz had opened the ad agency in the 70s. Jefferson's son and Jacob's two sons worked for them when they were of working age. After graduating college, Dennis Burkhardt decided he didn't want to be in the ad game and join the Air Force. Jacob's eldest son joined the firm and his youngest decided to try other ventures. Five years later, Jacob's youngest son was incarcerated for trafficking cocaine. During the court sessions, Jacob's health began to fail. He soon stepped down from BM and Sons, and his eldest son took his place. Meanwhile, after some dirty politics and some greasing of judicial palms, Jacob's youngest son was free to return to his legitimate business that he'd allegedly used as a cover for moving cocaine into the Houston area. Now Jefferson was running the agency with Jacob Sunbury. Barry had his name changed from Markowitz to Masters to avoid publicity from his drug-dealing brother. One day Barry approached Jefferson and told him that he had messed an ad up and that he'd spent two days kissing bum and making things right to avoid losing a big client, 
and he used the mistake as leverage to push Jefferson out of the business. Jefferson's daughter Margie married a man named Peter Stewart. Margie and Peter had a daughter named Amy. So Barry has been pulling this shit for a long time, huh? Yeah, he has. My grandfather admitted he messed up on the ad, but that was still not reason for Barry to pull that shit on him. Let me guess. The ad was for AM Motors. Yes, it was. Do you know who owns AM Motors? Alan Markowitz, I said. I didn't know until your story that he and Barry were brothers, but I knew they were in cahoots. AM doesn't pay anything but material costs for their advertising. Amy went on to tell me how often Barry had been asking her on dates or asking her to lunch. She had turned him down flat every time, and she could tell he was getting pissed off. I think that's the reason he made me stop working so close with you, Billy. After we had shared all of our information with each other, we made our plan and called it a night. I got home after midnight and looked in at Lynn. She was sleeping with my old pillow pulled in tight as if she were spooning it. I felt no pity at all for her. I did feel better knowing I wasn't going against Barry alone. Amy had been grateful that I had uncovered so much and that there was a way to strike back at him. She had envisioned putting up with his crap for a few years before she had enough to take him down. I ended up getting a reprieve for Thursday night. Barry told me to tell Lynn he was sorry, but he had a big meeting to attend and would be gone all weekend. Call her yourself, asswipe. I thought to myself as he left the office. I went home that night and mowed my yard and messed around in the garage for a while. When I went in to shower, Lynn was wearing a new negligee. Do you like? She asked me. I chuckled and said, you're wasting your time. Loverboy had a meeting and canceled tonight. You could take advantage then, she said without missing a beat. I just laughed. What's so funny, she asked. You thinking I want someone else's leftovers? That's a riot. What do you mean someone else's leftovers? I am still your wife. Aren't you forgetting the creepy piece of shit who is supposed to be screwing you tonight? The same creep that you decided to screw because humiliating me was so much damn fun? Go to hell. I want nothing to do with your festering hole. She stomped off to the bedroom and I took a shower. I grabbed my pillow and hit the couch. She must have been pissed off because I didn't hear her toy until almost midnight. The next morning Amy approached me at work. She smiled evilly and said, Guess who has to work on the AM Motors ad today? Is she bigger than a bread box? Funny. I want you to check it over when I am done. I am sure Barry has a plan for me. Did you know that he asked me to go to Florida with him this weekend? I shook my head. Yeah. I told him I had plans, then he got upset, and then told me the AM. Motors account was mine. Well, the jerk-off couldn't bed you any other way, so he has to lord some power. He just has to hope you don't quit. Oh, I won't quit. I have plans, she said as she winked and went back to her cubicle. After everyone else left for the day, I looked Amy's work over as she requested. It looked like every other AM Motors ad we had printed. I made copies of the information sheets and took a picture of her ad. So do you have plans for the weekend? She asked me. Just avoiding the wife, I said. You? No plans. I do have extra room if you want to avoid her completely. I'm not offering my body, but we could have a fun weekend. We did have fun. My fun began with ignoring Lynn's protests as I packed a bag. I even included work clothes for Monday in case I decided to not come home until Monday evening. It sounded like an echo in our house. Where are you going to be? Not here. If I could speak any other languages, I would have said more to her. Well, as long as she didn't speak them as well. My grandfather had taught me a few swear words in Polish, but I didn't feel like swearing at her. She was crying as I walked out the door. I know some would call me an a-hole but I could not be with a woman who took pride in humiliating me. I did plan on watching all of the surveillance video. I wanted to see the look on her face when she called my cell phone and discovered it was on the couch. Amy and I had a great weekend. When I got to her place, she came out with an overnight bag and told me to drive. After I had gone a few blocks, I said, Do we have a destination? Or are we just running away? She laughed, Oh yeah, we're going to a friend's house. They have a home on Lake Conroe. Her friends had a beautiful home. I knew if Lynn had seen it she'd want to sell our house and buy one like it. She had griped a time or two that we didn't live in the woodlands. Or in the heights but we did have a nice home so she'd finally stopped wishing so much. We spent Saturday on their boat. I drank several beers with Tony as we tried no to stare openly at Amy and Kathy lounging in their bikinis. 
When Amy wanted to water ski, I think we were both hoping for a suit mishap. That evening Tony did up the quintessential Texas barbecue. We had plenty of food and beer. They had several other friends come, and everyone seemed to have a wonderful time. Amy introduced me as a friend to everyone she knew. Tony and Kathy introduced me as Amy's friend. I was pleased at one point when one of the gals took Amy aside and told her she shouldn't let me get away because I was a keeper. I caught a thoughtful look on her face and then made sure she didn't see me looking her way. On Friday night, we each had a room. Since Tony and Kathy had another couple who'd driven from Baytown, they asked if I minded sleeping on the sofa so that they wouldn't have the long drive back. I didn't mind. If I had been at home, I would have been on the sofa anyway. Kathy left me to find me a pillow and blanket. I looked at the couch and realized it was the same one that had taken up residence in my own living room. I could hear Kathy talking to someone. I couldn't tell what she was saying or to whom she was speaking, but I definitely heard her say, okay, well, good night then. I heard a bedroom door close. I sat and waited for Kathy to return, but instead Amy came out. Hey, I have a full-size bed. No reason for you to sleep on the couch, Billy. I trust you to be a gentleman. I took one look at her and realized that arguing would be futile, so I accompanied her to the bedroom. She wore a long t-shirt to bed, and I didn't know if she had panties or shorts on underneath. I wore a pair of shorts so I wasn't too worried about inappropriate contact. I trust you to be a gentleman. Those words rang through my head when I awoke in the morning with Amy, spooning me and my hand, very casually holding her right jug. I moved to extricate my hand, and she gripped it. Not yet, Billy she said sleepily. She sighed and pushed into me further. I can't wait. Can't wait? Can't wait for what? I wanted to ask, but she'd resumed her light snoring. I awoke later alone in bed. For a few minutes, I lay there reveling in her smell on the pillow next to me. I got up and took a shower. I found everyone on the deck enjoying bacon and eggs and coffee. I saw a huge smile on Amy's face as I sat across from her. We all made small talk as we ate. I was slightly embarrassed and I kept catching Amy looking at me. Amy and I left in the early afternoon. I thanked Tony and Kathy for their hospitality and Kathy said she was sure we'd see more of each other. I wrote it off to them being good people and thought nothing more of it. We chatted lightly as we drove back home. We went back over our plan. I was sure Barry was going to make his play on Monday and we talked over contingencies. If he tries to make me have sex with him one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just make him fire me. At that point I'll drop my bombs as well. I won't make you stand alone. I know you won't, Billy. I glanced sideways as she said that. She wore a smile that I couldn't quite read. Then it dawned on me that she had been calling me Billy. I searched my memory and found that I couldn't recall the first time she called me that, but I loved the sound of it. We got back to Amy's apartment and I carried her bag to the door for her. You can stay here tonight if you want a Billy. I promise not to bite. Choosing between staying with Amy and going home to hear Lynn's bullshit wasn't hard at all. Amy did give me a curious look when I brought my work clothes in. Were we a bit confident that I'd let you spend Sunday night too? She asked. I chuckled. Well, I had hoped, but I was also ready to get a hotel room instead of listening to Lynn's crap. I had planned on sleeping on Amy's couch, but she wouldn't hear of it. I have a queen-size bed and I only use half of it. We slept together last night and nothing happened so we can do it again. A funny look passed over her face, but when she caught me looking at her she smiled. I know you're still married, and I don't want you to stoop to her levels. You are too good of a person, Billy. But I also admit that I loved waking up in your arms this morning. We slept in pretty much the same attire as the night before. I in shorts and her in a long t-shirt, but we woke in a different position. I woke up to find she had her face in my chest, and her leg was thrown over my hip. One hand was on my chest, and the other arm was wrapped around me. My arms fully encircled her, and I was glad that there was a little breathing room at our crotch areas. I was in heaven. I wished that I could hold her like that forever, with the scent of her hair filling my nose, and her warm, soft body fitting so well with mine. I realized that Barry had taken a lot more from me than just my wife. She had been my friend and my companion. I wasn't sure what I would do next, but I knew my life with Lynn was done. I would never be able to look at her again and not feel humiliation and cheating. Amy was great, but I didn't think she'd have any interest in a guy seven years older and unemployed. I dozed until Amy's alarm went off. 
We got up and took turns in the bathroom. I showered first and then got dressed while she was in the shower. I had planned on getting to the office before Jane or anyone else. I was about to leave when Amy came out of the bathroom with a towel around her hair and wearing a large bathrobe. I felt a bit awkward telling her that I'd see her at work. There was something behind her look, but I wasn't sure what it was. She smiled and told me to hurry. I was in the office 15 minutes before anyone else and had my task completed in 5 minutes. I then started the coffee and went to my desk. Within half an hour, everyone was there. Amy gave me an odd look as she walked to her cubicle. Barry, of course, was last to arrive. He didn't say anything to anybody as he went straight into his office. After lunch, he called Amy in. From my desk, I couldn't see or hear anything from Barry's office. Twenty minutes later, Amy came back out and went to her desk. I didn't get a look at her so I had no clue as to her mood. I did see that Barry had a spring in his step when he left at four. Everyone else was gone by five, and I stayed ten more minutes before I did a couple of things and went home. Lynn wasn't there when I got home. I loaded all of my clothes from the weekend in the washing machine and then went to my office. I checked the surveillance cameras and found that Lynn hadn't gone anywhere until that morning when she went to work. I deleted all of the video of Lynn masturbating. I went back and listened to audio on the two videos of Lynn using the phone. The first one was to her Aunt Lily. She wasn't saying anything about our issues, so I skipped to the next one. I didn't know who she was talking to, but I heard her say, You what? And after a pause she said, Oh that will be so hot. I need a hot night. I heard Lynn come home as I was finishing, so I opened my web browser and pretended to be completely enwrapped with some article. In a few minutes, I felt her staring at me from the doorway. Can we talk? You can, I told her. I have nothing to say to you. I missed you this weekend. I didn't miss you. Why do you have to be this way? Do I really have to remind you? You destroyed our marriage, and you think I am wrong to be a tad irked over it? I didn't destroy our marriage. Barry and I are making our marriage more fulfilling. If you want, I'll talk him out of making you wear your cage. When did you become such a dumb? Has Barry screwed all the brain cells out of you? The only thing fulfilling is me knowing what a tramp screwing 304 I married. Get the hell out of my office. The only time we need to see each other or even acknowledge each other is while Barry is making your sex fantasies come true. Other than then I don't need or want to be reminded of your skank bum. And that cage is just like you. Useless. I don't need it to keep me chased because when you two scumbags are rutting being turned on isn't even a remote possibility. As she walked crying out of my office I got a text message from Amy. At least something could make me smile. Her text was short. It's on. Are you getting out of here on time? Barry asked me on Tuesday. I have a few things to deal with so I'll be out half an hour late, I told him. Amy hadn't been at work so my needing an extra half an hour didn't look suspicious to him. Fine. I'll go eat at the Royal Fork, but I expect you and Lynn to be ready when I get there. And Jacko, I do mean ready. As soon as everyone was gone I packed a box with my personal belongings and wrote my resignation letter and laid it on Jane's desk. I took one last look around and realized that I wasn't going to miss the place at all. I arrived home to discover that Barry was already there. I walked in and Lynn tried to kiss me but I shut her down. She was wearing a short silk robe and I could see she wore stockings underneath. Where have you been? I was worried. I didn't say anything and walked into my living room. Barry was sitting on the couch sipping a glass of wine. I've been waiting for ten minutes, Jacko. A man who wants to keep his happy home and job shouldn't keep the guarantor of both waiting. But have a glass of wine. We are waiting for a special guest. I saw a look pass between him and Lynn, and then I went into the kitchen and got myself a beer. Barry looked at me with a distasteful look on his face. I think he was about to say something when my doorbell rang. Lynn ran to answer it and Barry got a shit-eating grin on his face. I heard Lynn greet someone and heard the door close. I looked up just as Lynn and Amy walked into the room. Amy, I'm so glad you decided to save your job, Barry gloated. You see, Lynn, Amy is as incompetent as Jacko is. She screwed up royally on my biggest account and now she'll be joining us. Jacko, you get a treat even though you haven't earned it. You see, I am going to screw each of these beauties in front of you. Lynn suddenly looked worried. As beautiful as she was, she paled in comparison to Amy, and Amy was a decade younger. She also saw the way Barry looked at Amy. Well, let's get this hot evening started. 
When Lynn called me Jacko, I saw a cross look pass over Amy's face. Barry looked slightly disappointed that Lynn was forcing the issue to go first. I know he was dying to get a piece of Amy. As we all headed down the hall, I glanced at my cell and saw the text messages I wanted to see. Just before we got to the bedroom, Amy asked where the bathroom was, and I pointed it out to her. She smiled and thanked me. I then noticed that she was carrying a small bag with her. I was ready to do my part in the evening's festivities. Lynn took off the robe to reveal that all she had on was a garter belt and stockings. I saw Barry's face light up and I wanted to punch him. As much pain as Lynn had caused me, I still couldn't deny that she had an awesome body. I took off my shirt and began to undo my slacks. Wait till Amy sees this, I said. I said it like I didn't want them to hear, but I fully intended for them to hear me. Both Barry and Lynn's faces changed. Lynn's face went from lust to anger and Barry's from lust to fear. I dropped my pants and stood there. Well, I am ready for my cage, I said. A new look passed over Barry's face. I have something better than a cage, he said reaching into a shopping bag that I hadn't noticed earlier. He pulled out a pair of black leather shorts. These will make it impossible for you to pleasure yourself. He tossed me the shorts and I started pulling them on. You better hurry before that girl gets out of the bathroom, Jacko, hissed Lynn. Yes, Jacko, save yourself a little embarrassment, chimed in Barry. I just couldn't let that go. You would know all about a little embarrassment, I told him. His eyes shot daggers. He was about to say something when the bathroom door opened and Amy stepped out. I thought I was going to swallow my tongue. I heard Lynn gasp and Barry groaned. I myself quickly pulled the tight leather shorts up, well as quickly as I could. I think they were a size or two too small. I wasn't quick enough to keep Amy from seeing what I had to offer. Amy looked absolutely stunning. She wore a baby blue corset with black panties that were trimmed in a lace matching the corset. Her marvelous cleavage would be enough to start a dead man's heart. Her sexy tan legs were bare all the way down to the blue pumps adorning her feet. The smile she threw me could have melted ice. Lynn caught the look and quickly said, Barry. She saw Jacko before he pulled his shorts up. Barry wasn't really listening. He gave her a dismissive yeah and continued to stare gape-mouthed at Amy. I kept expecting him to go all divinals and start touching himself. Barry, get over here and screw me. It's been so long since I've had a man, Lynn said. I almost laughed. She was doing her best to things back on track. Barry snapped out of it and dropped his trousers. Amy almost laughed when his pathetic tool popped free. She mouthed, Oh my God, and I saw the laughter in her eyes. As Barry got onto the bed and started playing with Lynn's jugs, she squealed as if he'd hit her with a cattle prod. Meanwhile, I reached back and raised the blinds and lowered them twice. I turned to see Amy staring at me with a curious smile on her face. I winked at her, and her smile broadened. On the bed, Barry and Lynn were starting to get into their coupling. Then all hell broke loose. From outside came a series of small explosions. Living in an area surrounded by refineries, you hear explosions once in a while. As the sixth one sounded, Amy screeched, What was that? I grabbed my slacks and pulled them on over the leather shorts and went rushing down the hallway. I opened the front door and yelled, God damn, Barry, your car is screwed up. All four tires were flat and the windshield and rear window were a mass of spiderweb cracks. Naturally, there was no indication of what had caused this to happen. Barry came running down my hallway naked and stopped as he got to the door. I never knew if the destruction of his Lexus caused him to stop or if he realized he was naked. It didn't matter because I put my foot in the middle of his back and sent him flying over my porch and onto my walkway. I then closed the door. I heard him yelling something but I didn't care. About that time Lynn came out of the hallway. She'd at least had the good sense to don her robe before coming to investigate. Where's Barry? She asked. And then she noticed there were two other people in the living room. I had let them in when I yelled about Barry's car. Who are these people? Jacko? What's going on? Are you Lynn Jack Swinsky? A lady in business attire asked. When Lynn nodded, she asked if she could see Lynn's ID. Lynn produced her driver's license and showed the woman. The woman handed her a pack of papers and said, You've been served. Lynn's face turned white. She looked at the papers in her hands in disbelief. Amy came out the hallway with Barry's clothes in the shopping bag. She had put the clothes back on that she had worn to my house that evening. 
The process server bade me a good evening and headed out the door. I stepped out and immediately looked for Barry. Barry was trying to hide on my porch. People had gathered to see what the commotion was all about, and they were laughing at Barry. The process server approached Barry and asked, Are you Barry Masters? Amy stepped out on the porch. Yes, he is. Here's his ID. The server handed him a stack of papers and, You've been served. I could swear she was laughing as she walked away. Amy dropped the bag of his clothes by him. You screwed up Jacko, Barry hissed. I'll get you for assaulting me. Barry, that process server saw you go running out and fall on your own. Read the papers, buddy boy. You are the one who's screwed. You're fired, Jacko. Don't bother coming to work tomorrow. Screw you, Barry. Jane already has my letter of resignation. I was about to say something else when the police pulled up. Barry screamed at them that I had assaulted him. No one else would corroborate his story, so all they ended up doing was writing him a citation for indecent exposure. I was disappointed that the tow truck got there for Barry's car before he looked at the paperwork he'd been handed. I went back inside to find Lynn sobbing on the couch. Where are you going, Lynn? Going? I, I, I don't understand. Where are you going? I don't want you here anymore, and I'm not leaving. Bill, baby. I don't want a divorce. I love you, and only you. Unfortunately, you don't love me. If you did, we wouldn't be here. You got all hot and horny thinking about humiliating me and screwed Barry. Our marriage was over at that very second. But you'll lose everything, Barry told us. Barry was full of shit, Lynn. I own this house. It was in my name before we married, so it's mine. I have filed using adultery and cruelty as cause. My attorney says with what I have provided her, I shouldn't lose much in this divorce. We did draw up a in irreconcilable differences paper if you just want to sign it and get this done. It offers you 30% of our assets, and I take none of your debt. Cruelty? How can you claim cruelty? You screwing that arsewad Barry in front of me and humiliating me constitutes cruelty. I have all of it on video. I also have you and Tiny Tim on video while I am not around. But you'll need my income now since Barry fired you. That's none of your concern. Now, if you need help, I'll carry your shit to your car, but you need to hurry. Amy and I are going to screw on the couch for a while. Lynn ran screaming out to her car and left. Over the following weeks, she'd slowly move her stuff out. She had moved in with one of her fellow tellers that had needed a roommate to help with her costs. We ended up splitting our assets 70 thirtieths. Luckily, I didn't have to use my videos against her. The only request she had was that I take the furniture. I saw Lynn a couple of years later. She had put on weight, but still looked good. She had a guy on her arm, and they were pushing a stroller. I don't think she saw me and I was fine with that. I tracked down all of Barry's former employees. Of the seven I talked to, four joined my class action sexual harassment suit. Both Steve and Kenny were more than enthusiastic and even Jane joined. Walt and Marion also signed on. Marion didn't ask for a full cut, but she wanted to testify. When Joan realized that Barry was going to get hit hard, she tried to file for divorce hoping to get her half before he was strung up and bled. When it was pointed out that she was a party to Barry philandering, she was told her asset split would come after the harassment suit was settled. During the harassment trial, investigators found inconsistencies with Barry's records. When they delved in a little further, they found large amounts of unexplained income for BM and Sons and AM Motors, along with copious amounts of cocaine. Alan skipped town just before the DEA could arrest him. Barry was arrested right outside of the courtroom. Joan was arrested later and had five ounces of cocaine on her at the time of arrest. After the lawsuits were settled, the government took everything Barry, Joan, and his brother had left. We all walked away with $200,000 in winnings from the suit. Barry got 30 years and Joan got 10. Alan later turned up in a Medellin, Columbia dumpster with his throat cut. On the night that Lynn was handed her papers, I told her that Amy and I were going to screw on her couch. I truly had no intention of screwing Amy, but I knew that the thought of the two of us staining Lynn's white couch was rubbing salt in the wounds. Amy had known beforehand that I was going to tell her that. I wanted desperately to sit, but the leather shorts wouldn't allow it. So I leaned on the back of the couch. Whatever I had been running on up to that point evaded me. The weight of everything suddenly bore down on me and I felt like collapsing into a heap and letting the world pass me by. I had no wife and no job. 
I was banking on a lawsuit victory, but who knew how long that would take? A future that had seemed so bright just moments before suddenly looked dark and foreboding. I was standing there crying when Amy put her arms around me. I felt like a moron crying in front of Amy, but she didn't seem to mind. It's all over Billy. She can't hurt you any longer. After a while, I started feeling better, and I noticed that Amy was back in the corset. When did you change back into that? I asked her, while you were kicking the vile witch out, do you like it? I almost told her it was wrong to show me what I couldn't have, but I had a Freudian slip and said, like it? Not at the moment. It's reminding me that I have these damn shorts on. I can help with that, she said. I half expected her to put her clothes back on. Instead, she started unbuckling my belt and sliding my slacks down. I must have had a quizzical look on my face. I want this, Billy. I have liked you since the first day I met you. When Jane told me about what Barry was doing, I knew I could end up with you. Last weekend was the best weekend of my life, and I want all of my weekends to be like that. Well, at least the waking up with you parts. I had no idea you felt. Jane knew? How the hell did Jane know? She smiled. Jane is my aunt. She's married to my uncle Dennis. She started working for my grandfather and Barry's father before she met my uncle. She did her own name change on her personal records so Barry never added two and two. Walt had called her after he left and told her to watch out for you. She was listening over the intercom when Barry invited himself to dinner. That's why she kept Barry's passwords so readily available. She also told me what a great guy she thinks you are, she said as she kissed me. Before I knew it, the tight leather shorts were on the floor. So even though I thought I had lied to Lynn about Amy and I screwing on the couch, Amy made sure that I was honest. When we got tired, we went back to her place to sleep. Neither of us wanted to sleep on the bed Barry had screwed Lynn on. Amy and I took our lawsuit winnings and bought a house near Tony and Kathy. I hired a company to manage my house for me. They keep good renters in it, and see that it's taken care of. Amy didn't mind me holding on to it. She saw it as kind of a security blanket for me that she never intended for me to need. Amy and I are part owners of a large advertising agency. Her uncle Dennis went in on it with us. It is the kind of place that Barry ran in his wet dreams. Walt and Jane both work there. Jane just likes having something to do. Amy and I share the responsibilities of day-to-day -day operations. We are never in the office at the same time though. When one of us is at the office, the other is at home with our two-year-old son Jefferson David, who is named after his great-grandfather and my father, and our five-year-old daughter Sadie Marie, who is named after our mothers. The best part is getting to wake up spooned with the love of my life. Her body only improved after having the kids, and she never lets me doubt her love for me. I truly can't ask for anything more. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like share and subscribe.